Hey, Andrew, can you hear me?
Hey folks, give us uh, one or two minutes here. We're just trying to get the host properly connected. Um, this webinar is definitely still on. We're still gonna uh, give you guys the, um, the content that you guys are looking for. Uh, we just need to figure out a connection issue. Thanks for, thanks for waiting. Okay, can you hear me? All right, thanks. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, a few connection issues seem to be sorted out now. Uh, so my name is, is Drew Barbier, and I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Sci-Fi. Today's webinar is called From a Custom 2 Series Core to Hello World in 30 Minutes. Today, I'll also be joined by Amy Lindbergh, who's also a director of product management at Sci-Fi. In this webinar, I'll, we will introduce Sci-Fi Core Designer, as well as go into a little bit more detail about our RISC-V core IP deliverables and the software devel development methodology. At the end of this webinar, you should know how to create a custom Sci-Fi 2 Series core and how to write software targeting that core. This is the, the third part in a three-part webinar series. The previous two webinars uh, covered an introduction to RISC-V, and we also went into more detail on the, the architecture and features of the two series uh, core IP. These webinars were recorded and they're available on the link below. And we'll also share them on our YouTube channel after the series completes. With that, I'd like to hand it over to, to Amy Lindbergh. Okay. Let me get set up here. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Drew. So as Drew mentioned, I'm the product manager for the Sci-Fi core designer. And I've popped us up to the top of the stack here at Sci-Fi. What we're looking at right now is our North Star, silicon at the speed of software. But practically speaking, what does that mean? To us, it means the ability to create custom silicon and get it to you rapidly. And for us, this is a game changer. Any tool that does this is really going to change the way we designed silicon today. And the core designer is a great example of that. The core designer lets you literally take an architectural design space and work within that. You can create a series of cores and run your software on those cores and find the best fit for your application.
Just as Moore's law is coming to an end and going to the next process node is prohibitively expensive, we think that designers are going to look to custom silicon to find the performance that they need. And this is what the core designer is all about. And I'm really excited to show that to you. But before we go there, I want to refresh how we classify our cores at Sci-5. Now, if you've been following along with this web series, you've seen this chart before. We have three classes of cores, and we have three series, which are really microarchitectures. If you combine both of these things together, you get a design space, and we call these core series. Now, the core designer, which I'll go into right now, operates on core series. So right now, we're looking at the E2 series. Here you see three cores. We call these our standard cores. You can consider these cores as particular configurations within the, the design space. They're pre-built, essentially. And you can get them by just clicking on Get. You can get an evaluation version of these cores. Try them out for yourself. But what's really interesting is that you can customize these cores. So we're going to start with E21. There we go. First thing I'm going to do is name my core. All right. So I'm customizing the E21. And the first thing you'll notice is on the left-hand side, we've got a number of categories here. When we looked at the design space, we decided to organize it a bit for you so that you could logically operate within different categories. On the right-hand side, you see what we call a core complex. So here we have not just a core, but we have some other components around the core that you need, and these can be configured too. Now let's look at the first panel. What really stands out for me are the ISA extensions. And that is one of the best parts of RISC-V, the fact that it's modular. And in the core designer, we really work with this. You can turn off extensions or turn them on. And watch how the ISA definition changes on a core complex. It's as easy as that. I'm adding a bunch of instructions and thousands of gates, or I'm turning them off. Pretty powerful. So continuing on, memory, E21 comes with two banks of tightly integrated memory. I can take one out. Similarly, ports. I can remove a port, can change the protocol. Security. I can change the level of PMP. There are a few debug options. I can configure my interrupts. And there's some power management options. So when I've made some choices, I can look at what I've got. Now here again, I'm comparing the core that I built, Omega-1, with the E21 standard core. <clears throat> and I can see very clearly what I've changed. I can go back and make more choices. But when I'm happy with my design, I build. <clears throat> now, it takes approximately 24 hours for us to build your core. And when you're done, you get what we call a dev kit. This includes RTL, Testbench RTL, an FPGA bitstream, and a custom manual and user guide. Drew's gonna go into each of these later in the, in the, web, the webcast. But now, I wanna introduce you to your workspace. This is where all the cores that you create get collected. And this is where you can download cores. So here you see a core dev kit that's ready to download. Go back in, look at the settings on this core. Okay, so how do you get this awesome thing? Okay, right now today, if you go to our website, 
You can explore all the architectural trade-offs by just clicking Design Core. You can create core designs and save them in your workspace. Now, if you sign up for our Core Designer Beta, you could be among the first to be able to build trial cores. We're going to be rolling this functionality out in the weeks to come. But if you have an enterprise project and you're ready to go, by all means, contact sales. Give us a shout. Tell us what you're up to, and we can help you out. Hey, it's been a real pleasure to show you what the core designer is all about. We're super excited about this product, and we'd love to have you try it. OK, Drew, hand it back over to you. Thanks, Amy, for the walkthrough of Core Designer. I think it's a really powerful tool and allows our customers to explore the configuration space of our core series in a very simple and easy manner. So once you've done that, let's take a look at the actual development kit that you would download from your workspace. So what you would get is a tar file that contains all the deliverables that Amy mentioned. First off, an RDA7 uh, 100T FPGA bitstream. So this is the configuration of the core that you configured wrapped together in a peripheral subsystem and synthesized into an FPGA bitstream that can be preloaded onto an FPGA. Now the purpose of this is so that your software development team can get started writing applications targeting this custom core immediately and not have to wait for another iteration or design phase on your side to actually integrate the deliverable into the design. And we'll talk more about that in a demo in a, few, in a little bit. The next folder would be the docs folder. This contains several documents that are useful for getting started. So the first and one of the most useful is the manual. And as Amy mentioned, this manual is configured specifically for the configuration that you generated via Sci-Fi Core Designer. In other words, it reflects the exact design. So if you added custom instructions or uh, configured the memory map, the manual will reflect those changes precisely. Then we also have a user guide. And the user guide really describes how to consume the IP deliverable. And this would be information regarding integration of the design into your own environment, descriptions of the, the test bench, uh, which we'll also talk about uh, in demo later, clocking and synthesis constraint files and things like that. And then we also have the FPGA user guide. And this explains how to take advantage of the, the FPGA bitstream, which is included. Moving back into the top level, we have an information folder. And this folder contains metadata about the design uh, containing several different pieces of information. So first, the, the device tree. So the device tree is a, a standard file format that describes our, our IP deliverables. So it describes the core, but as well as the core, it also contains the, the onboard peripherals and their memory maps. And I'll explain how we take advantage of this device tree uh, in a bit. The info folder also contains a retiming file. So the retiming file would list modules included in the design, which could benefit from retiming. So retiming is a uh, synthesis technique that allows you to achieve higher performance and higher frequencies. And specifically on the two series, if you can configure it with floating point, the floating point unit would benefit from retiming and would be listed in this file. The info folder also contains information regarding sci fi insight. So it contains a YAML file which describes all of the sci fi insight signals. And we'll get more into sci fi insight in the demo as well. Then moving back up to the top level, there is a test folder which includes all of the, the tests that are delivered as part of the test bench. And in the Verilog folder, this is where you will find the actual design of the, the core IP, along with the test bench and Sci-Fi Insight Verilog modules and the SRAM behavioral models. And then finally, there's a make file which allows you to run the simulation test bench. 
So now let's look at software development. So Freedom ESDK is a software developer environment that, can, that provides a command line driven workflow, including examples and utilities which target sci fi uh, platforms. And these platforms could be standard core IP deliverables, they could be FPGA deliverables, they could be sci fi development boards, or they could be custom deliverables generated by sci fi core designer. And the way this is accomplished is by using a bare metal API layer we call Freedom Metal. And Freedom Metal allows for portable software to be written, which can work across Sci-Fi's entire portfolio of products. And the way we do this is with uh, creating Freedom Metal BSPs. So by default in Freedom ESDK, if you were to go to our GitHub repository today, you would see Freedom Metal BSPs for all of the standard core IP. Now you can imagine with the configuration space that we expose and that Amy talked about uh, in Sci-Fi Core Designer, that can make creating software a bit of a challenge because configurable hardware also requires configurable software. And so what we do is we take advantage of um, the device tree files that are delivered with the IP bundle and we have utilities that can automatically create Freedom Metal BSPs by using the output of the, the device tree files. So in this way, custom cores that are generated with Sci-Fi Core Designer can be supported by Freedom ESDK and Freedom Metal. And we've actually written an application note walking uh, customers through this exact process. And this application note is on our website. Moving forward, Freedom Metal BSPs will be included as part of the IP deliverable uh, going forward. So the IP bundle that I described earlier would have another folder called Freedom ESDK. And in that folder, it would already contain the pre-built Freedom Metal BSP. And this is something you can expect in the next few weeks. Okay, so now let's look at using the actual FPGA deliverable. For the two series FPGA deliverables, we target a low cost FPGA platform created by Digilent. And this is the RD100T. And this FPGA board has a, quite a bit of resources with over 100,000 Xilinx logic cells. It also has an external QSPY serial flash interface and 256 megabytes of DDR3. It is relatively low cost at around $250 but gives a significant capability. So the two series is able to be synthesized in this FPGA at 32 megahertz. And this allows for evaluation of the CPU performance, running real software at hardware speed. And again, this is really meant to help your software development teams get started evaluating the custom core that was generated via Sci-Fi Core Designer as soon as it's ready, as opposed to waiting for another integration step on uh, integrating that custom Verilog deliverable into your own maybe a PGA environment. So these FPGA boards can be purchased directly from Digilent via the link on the web on the slide here. Now connecting the uh, Freedom Studio to the FPGA is is fairly simple. We need a JTAG connection, and in this slide we describe how to connect the uh, the JTAG wires, which we wire up in the FPGA bitstream to this uh, JD PMOD connector, uh, which is the connector closest to reset. And we'll show the pin mapping between that connector and the standard uh, JTAG 20 pin connector. And this is again described in the RD FPGA deliverable, uh, RD FPGA user guide. Now this will work with a lot of different JTAG probes. Today we'll be using the, the Alamex Pro, but this also works just fine with Segger J-Link or IER iJet or Lauterbach Trace32. Okay, so now let's do a demo. So we'll use Freedom Studio to program the RD100T with a custom Sci-Fi core. 
Then we'll create a new project targeting this specific FPGA platform. And then we'll program that application into the FPGA and run it and debug it. Okay, so this is the Eclipse environment for Freedom Studio. And if you're familiar with Eclipse, you'll be right at home with Freedom Studio. So to create a new Freedom ESDK project, we'll click File, New, C Project, Make File Project, Freedom ESDK. And so for this particular project, we'll name it Hello. Now what's going on here is that Freedom Studio is actually driving Freedom ESDK and its command line interface underneath. So any work that's done in the, the Freedom ESDK command line environment also translates to Freedom Studio. And what you'll see here in this window is that we're able to select targets and the target list that's provided in the window is the target is the list of BSPs that are in Freedom ESDK. So in this particular example, we'll select the E21 RD example, and we'll select the Hello example program. And again, the list of programs that are displayed are the list of programs that are included in Freedom ESDK. So I'll click Finish now, and what happens is that example program is copied into my workspace and then built automatically. So I can see my application was built. And if I look at the source code for this application, it's just a very simple printf hello world. So now that I've built my application, let's actually program the RD board. So if I, I can do that by clicking the sci fi tools menu and then flash MCS. In this case, I want to make sure that I'm selecting the 100T, and then I select the right FPGA bitstream that I want to program. In this case, this is the right bitstream, the E21 targeting the 100T. So I click OK. And then we'll begin the programming process. And so what's happening here is actually the Xilinx FPGAs use the external spy flash to hold the program that it wants to uh, configure, the program that it wants to load into itself. And so what we're doing is using an open source utility called XC3S prod to load a small, simple RISC-V core into the FPGA, and then use that core to program the external spy flash with the FPGA bitstream. Now this process takes a few minutes, so we'll wait here while it completes. All right, the flash process completed successfully. Be sure to hit the program button. So right now, that's what I'll do. Hit the program button, I'll hit OK. Now what I want to do before we run this application is actually open a serial uh, console so that I can see the result of this printf in Freedom Studio. I can do that in the terminal window by selecting USB 1, which is specific to my machine, and also set the baud rate to 11.5200. So if I do that, I can see that we had already captured some information from the serial terminal. So I'll clear that. And now I'll begin a debug session. And as you can see now, it's loading the program into the board. And there we are, we're at main. So at this point, I'm able to run the program. And if I hit um, resume, you see hello world displayed on the serial console. Um, so now as an example, I'll say, uh, change this to say hello webinar 
and then we'll rebuild this, program it. And again, if I run it, now you see it says, hello webinar. I can also halt. And at this point, uh, Freedom Studio is really like debugging any other embedded application. I get my call stack view where I can click through the call stack. I can view the hardware registers and so on and so forth. So at this point, uh, developing software targeting the, the custom core on the FPGA, it's just like you had a real development board on your desk. Right, so we used Freedom Studio to flash an FPGA. We made a new project targeting the, the image that we flashed on the FPGA. And then we actually programmed that application and, and debugged it. So that was great. Now let's do the same thing, but this time instead of targeting the, the FPGA, let's target the RTL test bench. So again, we're gonna use Freedom Studio to create a project targeting the E21 RTL test bench. Then I'll actually run that test using the, uh, the RTL simulator. And then we'll explore the resulting waveform using the sci 5 Insight tool. So if I go back to Freedom Studio, we'll make a new project. So file, new C project. We'll select Freedom SDK project. And we'll call this one user mode. In this case, I'm going to change the target to say E21 RTL. This sets up the proper VSP, which targets the RTL bit test bench. And I'll select the example program, example user mode, and then click finish. As you can see, this creates a new project and automatically builds the project. I don't want to run a debug session just yet. So let's take a look at what this example application is doing. So at some point, this application moves from machine mode privilege mode to user mode. And when it enters user mode, it's going to enter in this user mode entry point function. And so if I look at this function, what happens is it's going to try to read a machine mode CSR and since I'm in user mode at this point, it should trigger an exception. And at this point, if the exception is properly caught, it will exit zero, which uh, indicates that the test finished successfully. So because the application was automatically built, you'll see a number of files in the debug folder. In this case, for the RTL test bench, you'll see the, uh, the hex file, which is properly formatted to be loaded into the RTL test bench. So now I'll switch over to my console, which is in the actual E21 RTL bundle. And so if I take a look at this directory, um, you can see that it has the same format as what we described earlier. And if I look at the test folder, you can see that I've already copied the user mode program to this folder. So now if I wanted to run this test on the RTL test bench, I could simply use the make file and tell it that tell it the test that I want to run. So in this case, I'm going to run make user mode. And then I have the option to tell it to uh, generate the waveform so that I can view it with my waveform viewer. In this case, I do that by extending the waveform uh, extension .vpd. So at this point, it runs the simulation. We'll give it a minute. Okay. And so now the simulation is running and what you're seeing is a trace of what's being committed in the, the RTL simulation. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail while the test runs. So these logs are saved to the, the directory that they're run from. And that's very helpful for understanding what's happening in the RTL simulation. And so again, these are cycle by cycle 
uh, logs of what's happening in the design. So if I look on the left, uh, you'll see um, the heart ID of the, the particular trace. So in this case, C0, that stands for core zero or, or heart ID zero. The next line tells you the particular cycle count that it uh, corresponds to. The next field tells you whether or not an instruction was committed. So if you see a one, that means that this particular instruction was committed. And if you see a zero, that means that that instruction was not committed on that cycle. So in this second instruction that you see in the trace window here, where it's a zero, that means no instructions were committed in that cycle. You also have a view of the program counter address, as well as the registers and their values. So you can see uh, the first one is using register one, 15, and zero, and you can see the values of those registers in that cycle. And then finally, you can see the opcode of the given uh, instruction. So now if I go back to my RTL simulation, I can see that my, my test passed which is great. That means it exited with a, a code of zero. So now let's take a look at sci fi Insight and what we make sure that the, the test application was doing what we think it was doing. So in this case, you can see that we now have a uh, user mode.out file and a user mode.vpd. So the .out file contains the, the log that you see here. The VPD is the waveform that was generated that, that we asked for. So I already have my, my waveform viewer open. And in this case, you can see very clearly in the test harness uh, that we have a module in the design called Sci-Fi Insight. So if I take a look at this, uh, what you'll see, uh, and maybe as a refresher, so Sci-Fi Insight is a curated list of signals in the design that give uh, our customers a better understanding of what's happening in the simulation. So they can really do uh, be a lot more effective when they're debugging simulation waveforms. So in this case for the, the E21, I can see I have a uh, click inside the inside module. The click is the interrupt controller and I can see certain signals uh, that are um, part of the interrupt controller. I have a core module inside Sci-Fi Insight that gives me a list of signals inside the core that are potentially useful during simulation debug like a PC I can also see when instructions committed, when an exception happened, the register file. I can also see uh, certain CSRs. So in this case, the exception program counter. Uh, I can also see M cause in fields inside M cause. And the same thing with M status. I can see all the values inside M status and they're broken out how you would expect them based on the, the grouping of the bits in the register fields. So now for this example, I've actually pulled out a few signals that are important to this particular example. In this case, I, can, I have the clock signal, I have the program counter, I have exception, exception program counter, the exception code. So this is from the M cause register. And then I have the machine previous privilege level. And this is from the, the M status register. So if I zoom all the way out, I can see that uh, as the simulation ran, something interesting happened around this point in time. And I can see that very easily by looking at uh, the exception field that an exception was generated. I can also look at MPP and see that the previous privilege mode changed at some point in time. So if I zoom in a little bit on this, I can see that the privilege mode changed from three to zero. So that's when we drop down into uh, user mode. And then sometime later, an exception happened. And I can see that in ex after the exception happened, the exception program counter contains this address 2001CC. Uh, so this is the address of the instruction that caused the exception. And if I zoom in a little bit more, I can see that my program counter was indeed 2001 CC when the exception occurred. So the, the, the CPU latched in the correct address. 
And so what's interesting is I can tie this all the way back to my compiled application. So if I take the same address and I go back to Freedom Studio, I can see that in addition to the hex file, we also generated an assembly listing file. And this file shows me the exact assembly addresses of instructions tied to the uh, C code as well. So if I look for this particular address, 2001cc, we should be able to tie this back to the um, the exception that was generated here. So let me make sure I got that right. 01cc. There we go. Okay. So now I can see exactly uh, address 1cc, and at that address was a CSR read instruction. And again, because we were in user mode, that generated an exception, and that matches exactly what we expected to happen. The exception was generated, and we exited with a code of zero, which is exactly what was expected, and the test passed. So again, using the tools that are available in Freedom Studio, in Freedom ESDK, in Sci-Fi of Insight, allow me to very easily uh, generate applications which target sci fi RTL test benches and debug those test benches for, for any unexpected behavior. So that's going to conclude the uh, hands-on demo and webinar today. As always, for more information, please, uh, we have a few resources for you to visit. So RISC5.org uh, should be first. So this contains the most up-to-date RISC-5 specifications. It also has links to the RISC-5 uh, mailing list as well as workshop proceedings. Also, GitHub is a very valuable resource, uh, so you can find uh, Freedom ESDK, Freedom Metal, and everything that we've shown here on uh, our GitHub page, uh, github.com slash sci-fi. And then sci-fi.com is where you can go to find RISC-5 IP from sci-fi as well as development boards. You can find the tools that we use here today in Freedom Studio and any binary distributions of the RISC-5 tools. We also have a very active user forum and I would encourage everyone to, to get involved. So again, this was the, the last of a three-part webinar series. This will be, the recording for this webinar will be available on the link provided below. And then we'll also post this on our YouTube channel as well. And as Amy mentioned, I would encourage everybody to go configure a two series core now. This is available today and we're happy to work with you to make sure that you're successful. Thank you very much.